Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 30th. Wow, 30th. Hard to believe, huh? 2018. This is the week and charts. Obviously, you want to thank all you guys and girls for coming this week. Um, I've been really busy, like I've been saying, so my apologies for not reminding you guys that there's a show and uh, starting late, etc. But I promise to get back on track. I've been working on a learning management system day and night, and that's really nearly killing me. But it's it's coming out really good. I'm pretty excited about it. So anyway, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now. And then obviously just zip by, but if you get bored, you can go to my website and actually read it. A lot of interesting facts in there, like if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast, never take a laxative and a sleeping pill in the same night. Really good, uh, really good advice and lots of warnings. All right, enough of that nonsense. So what are we going to talk about? Well, are we in a new bull leg higher? And I think that might be left over from a prior presentation, but uh, I think it's valid, and we'll get to that, and like we talked about last week, new highs will often beget new highs, and when the market is at or near new highs, you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend. By the way, I've been getting a lot of very nice emails from you guys and girls regarding the market timing stuff, so thank you so much on that. I appreciate it. Uh, go in and watch the last few weekend charts, and you'll get a little more on that, and I also have an article That'll probably be published in Proactive Magazine tomorrow, which talks a little bit about the system. So, but check out my website for that. So, what are we talking about this week? Well, I guess uh, before I mention that, uh, any questions you have on trading, feel free to ask them. If you don't mind, keep them to the slides just so my ADD doesn't kick in and I don't get sidetracked. And then once we get to the live charts, feel free to ask about anything. Speaking of live charts, once we do get to the live charts, let me know what your favorite stock picks are. We'll take a look at them. And if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time. So this week, we're going to talk about trading IPOs. And I copied this graphic from a presentation I did a while back. And I noticed that I have trading really big. And there's a reason why. And that reason is because they are made to trade. For those of you who haven't watched the first four videos of Trading Full Circle, I'd recommend you do so. You can find those at this Two dash trade dash stocks dash successively URL. Extra disclaimers today. Okay, let's talk about initial public offerings and more specifically a simple setup to get you on them. Some other setups that'll help to get you in early. And more importantly, the fact that they're made to trade, and they could be a trader's dream. And we're also in a longer-term bull market so far, at least, when it comes to IPOs. And one of the things I did in preparation for this presentation was to take a look at all the IPOs of the last 200 days or so. And it's been a pretty impressive run. The good news is, is the dichotomy between the good and the bad. Now, I've told the story a thousand times, so let me just zip through it real quick. The story of the sardines is that soldiers or whoever were trading sardine tens, and the price kept going higher and higher. There was a bubble in sardines, and the person who bought some very expensive sardines decided he was going to eat them, and he found that they were rotten. So he went to the last guy that sold him the sardines, and said, hey, you sell me rotten sardines. He's like, you silly fool, those are for trading, not eating. Now, a lot of times these things take off, and then they come right back in. And that's why you have to have a money management plan in place. That's why you can't fall in love with them and be willing to get out of the way. Now, the good news is when they first take off, a lot of times you can make a lot of money. And if the promise doesn't materialize, so what? You might lose a little bit of open profits, but you'll still make quite a bit of money. And obviously, as usual, money management and position management and all this is key. I'm a big fan of symbolism. I'm looking over my door right now, and I have this sign, Sardine Drive, right over my sign. So it reminds me that 
I'm here to trade IPOs, not fall in love with them. Now, when it comes to IPOs, there might not be any substance whatsoever, but it's not our job to judge. Now, I will give you a few caveats in a minute where you might want to wait for a secondary signal. In other words, you might want to let them establish themselves a little bit before getting in. That could be from a technical analysis standpoint, and that could also be from a, I don't want to use the word fundamental analysis standpoint, but from a sector standpoint, like what are they doing? Now, I remember when I first gave this presentation, my goal was to come out with a simple system that would keep you out of something like Snapchat, which I thought was the stupidest IPO and stupid town. But it's not for me to judge. But I figured, you know, this thing is probably overhyped and stupid. So let me design a simple little system, which I'm going to give you here in a few minutes, or setup, I should say, that would get you in Snapchat if it works and keep you out if it didn't. And shortly thereafter, Blue Apron came out, and we used the same thing in Blue Apron, and that avoided yet another debacle. Now, it's our job to make money, okay? It's not our job to reason. And IPOs can be a wonderful trading vehicle. That's the whole point. The two things you have to remember is only by those that go up. It's that simple. And I'll flesh that out. And then have a chair ready for when the music stops or the sardine begins to stink. Now, Will Rogers, who's possibly my brother from another mother, said you want to buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Well, amen, my brother from another mother. And then I thought I was the first. I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but he has trend following moron button. And I thought I was the first, but evidently Will Rogers was the first. Now, obviously, he was being a little tongue-in-cheek. When he said that, said that, but there is some truth to that. Now, the number one reason to trade IPOs is there's a hard and fast rule when it comes to technical analysis. If a market is going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's got to pass through B. There's no hard and fast rule for any other methodology or trading method. Now, the beauty of IPOs, and years ago I went in and did studies and spent a lot of time going through every single IPO, and I had the premise that, okay, let's say an IPO comes public somewhere around here. Well, if it's going to go and be the greatest stock ever, it's going to have to pass through B along the way, and I did a lot of studies on that, and in fact, I actually just have a pattern called buy at B. There's quite a few caveats to that pattern. And I'll show you something similar to it with a little bit more concrete rules in just a few minutes. But essentially, you are looking to get in somewhere around B. Now, the question about IPOs is, I always get questions. Dave, should I buy this IPO? Should I buy that IPO? It's like, well, I don't, I don't see it. What, where is it? Oh, it hasn't come public yet. It's like, well, no. Okay. The problem with, I know some people who have large accounts with large brokerages and they buy these IPOs pre-market. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But in general, it's a bad idea. And even they'll tell you, it seems like the ones that you can get pre-market are the ones you don't want that they're trying to unload. But I would strongly urge you to not try to buy them when they just come out or even try to acquire them before they come out. And as you can see, this issue here came public and tanked. And here's another one that came public, went sideways, and then it tanked. And then even while hype companies should not be bought right away. Now, obviously, Facebook has done much better since. But notice that when it first came public, it made its high on its first day. 
and lost over half of its value over the next several weeks. That would have been a very, at least initially, bad investment. Now let's look at some of the characteristics of IPOs. And I spent, I don't know how many hours total, but it was a lot. It was maybe eight hours or so just on IPOs in the course. And what I'd like to give you today is just a thumbnail. That's why I have some. Now one thing I've observed in all of my research is there's a few very, very, very common pattern. And the most common pattern of, of them all is the fly and the die. Now I went into a lot of details of the course on why this is. But the reality is that there's a lot of excitement back here. And then that reality begins to set in over here. So again, this is why we are trading them using the sardine story as a metaphor. Now, the die and die is probably even more common than the fly and die. More often than not, these things just stink. The good news is you can avoid putting capital in the harm's way, as you'll see over and over the next few examples. That uh, link, by the way, I'm getting asked to put the IPO link up. That was actually the link for the trading full circle. And I'm going to talk about the learning management system in a little while. Learning management system does have a lot of IPO information in it. If you're interested in the IPO course, www.davelander.com slash trade IPOs. And I'll get a... If you want $200 off on that, I'll get a promo code to you. Just shoot me an email, and um, I'll honor that until uh, for the month of September. I just didn't have time to get the promo together. Now, one thing that's really interesting about IPOs and just flat out amazes me is that the significant high is made or significant low is made during the first week of trading. So you've got five bars, one, two, three, four, five. That's one week's worth of trading. And from that, a lot of times they either take off or they die. There's this great dichotomy. And I have, I started, I forget when I released the IPO course. It's been a few years, but I was hesitant to put that course out because I was worried that the IPO bull market would die. And it kept going. And somewhere in between now and then, or now and back then, I should say, there were a few times where I thought it might be dying out. But what's kind of what was kind of cool is the dichotomy got bigger and bigger. Well, a lot of them came public and died, but then a few very nice ones took off greatly. So that was really cool. That even though if you were Looking at it statistically, you could get on TV and say, oh, the IPO market is horrible. Look at the statistics. But if you looked at it in more detail, you would have seen that there was this great dichotomy and you could have avoided a lot of losing trades and caught a few nice winners. Now, as I said a minute ago, your significant high or low is often set on the first week of trading. And you should be even more leery when that significant high or low is set on the first day of trading. And you're going to be surprised at how many IPOs come public and then just begin to die. I ran out of time before I went live this morning. That's one reason I was a little late. But I had so many examples I had to start calling them out of how many IPOs just came public and died. So I guess I could make a case if I wanted to about how crappy they are, but that's not the real story. The real story is just avoid the crappy ones and then what's left, look to trade. So what I did this morning was I went in and looked at the last couple of hundred days of IPOs and a lot of today's presentation comes from that. So you can see the stock here, EVER. Will it ever rally? No, I don't think it will. Notice on day one, it made its high, and so far, it's lost nearly half of its value. And of course, draw your big blue arrow if you don't believe me. 
Here's another one, UXIN, came public, first day of trading, made its high, lost over half of its value. Don't believe me, draw your big blue arrow. Here's another one. This one went a little sideways at first, but notice that it did begin to implode and once again lost about half of its value. And yet one more. Again, I told you I had so many of these I had to call them out. And here's yet another one. I didn't realize I had that many left in here. Day one, the high is set, and then it began to implode. Now, one thing that I've observed over and over again, I think it was Snapchat, if memory serves, and quite a few other stocks too. But sometimes that high is set on day two. And what happens in that situation is there's an initial euphoria over the stock, and then that has a little bit of follow-through on the following day, and then it begins to die. And this is a very, very, very common pattern. So let's take a look at that. Here we have a stock comes public. Notice that on the next day it begins to rally just a smidge higher, and then because the then begins to come back in. Here's another example. And again, these are all recent examples. I went in this morning and just grabbed the last couple hundred days. So these are less than one year old. Notice that on day two, it looked like it was off to the races. It might have got a few people excited. Like, ooh, this thing's really taking off. I better hop on. And then, of course, it found its high. So... What I'm trying to say here is make sure you let the IPOs establish themselves first. Now, you only really have to wait five days. My buy a B pattern will get you in at the end of day five with a lot of caveats, provided it's closing a new high and quite a few other caveats. And then the Dave Light, five-day Dave Light system or setup will get you in possibly on the close of day six. So you want to let them establish themselves. Now, I give credit to Doug Newberry, and Doug thinks it might have been Bill McKinley, his partner back then, that said this. So, Bill, if, if you said this first, I'll give you credit. <laughs> anyway, he used to joke by saying, either Doug or Bill, wait until they cross back above their two-day moving average. And I think Doug quoted Bill on this quite often. It's like me quoting Linda Rasky so much on some things, people begin to quote me as saying, those things. Anyway, he was being a little tongue-in-cheek when he said this, but it did make some sense in that you should let them establish themselves. Now, we're traders, so we're not going to wait for 200 days, which is nearly a year's worth of trading. We're going to look to get in a little quicker. But inspired by that, I said, well, what would happen, and this was, again, to keep you out of something crappy or perceived as crappy, such as Snapchat, but what would happen if we took a five-day moving average and said that you had to have some day light, okay? And that's the only rule, or first rule, I should say. And the second rule would be buy on the close of the first day the stock makes a new closing high. Let me try that again. I had some chili this morning for breakfast. Rule number two, buy on the close the first day the stock makes a new closing high. And if the highest bar was set on day one, it must also close above the range of day one. And that'll make a lot more sense in a few minutes. So again, this is what it would look like. And in this particular case, day one was the high of the week, the first week, one, two, three, four, five. This would be the fifth day here. So it not only has to close above this close, which is the high close, but also has to close above that high. Now, if this high was not set on day one, then this would be the close, the closing high. And you can see here we have Dave Light, meaning the low is greater than the five-day moving average, and you would buy on the close. Now, those of you who've known me over the last 20-something years know that I am a pullback player. 
in IPOs, they do have a bit of a breakout characteristic. I don't like breakouts in markets in general because they tend to fail. Maybe before everybody their brother had a computer and a smartphone now, I guess, in their hands or on their desk, breakouts worked a little better. But now a lot of times people come in to manipulate the markets on those breakouts to take advantage of that situation. However, in IPOs, there is a breakout characteristic that is very much worth trading. And that pattern or this particular pattern will get you in on a bit of a breakout. So here's another case where you can see it made a new high. I'm sorry. Here's another case where the first day of trading, the stock made a new high or establishes high for the week, I should say. And remember, the rule is that we also not only need a new high with this particular setup, we also need Dave light, meaning the low is greater than the moving average. So you would actually buy on that close. Now, it could be a little scary buying into those highs. And it's, 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 I have to close my eyes and push the button. Okay, it's not easy for me either. Years ago, I was very lucky to have a futures broker. And he was very lucky in that he worked with a particular market wizard. And he used to, I think the story is he used to, what do you call that? The little surfboard where you got the little paddles on your feet. Boogie board? He used to boogie board somewhere around this guy's house. And he was doing this high school project where he was interviewing millionaires and he, got, he became friendly with a guy through his little project, and he helped him a lot on trading. And the, this particular person said, sometimes the best time to buy a market is when it's just making new highs. And I, that made a lot of sense to me. It really struck a chord with me. It's a hard thing to do, but sometimes it's the best thing to do, especially in something like an IPO. So let's take a look at a few examples here. Here you can see on day two, the high was set. So we're going to go off the closing high for that week, which was actually set on day one. You have Dave Light. You get a new closing high. And you look to buy. Now here's another example where you had... Dave Light. So technically, your buy would have been right here. You didn't really clear that range that well, or it wasn't that much of a significant closing high, but that's an official signal right there if you're looking to trade it slightly more mechanically. And then a more exciting signal, obviously, would be like over here. Now, here's a stock I'm actually long right now off of this pattern and you can see that the on day one the high was set so what's the rule well we can't get long until we close above that high and again it's kind of scary buying into these highs and boy i hope i don't fall on my face on this one and look like an idiot but you know me i like to show open trades when they're relevant to what we're talking about so we can see how they shake out good bad or indifferent and no matter what happens we have an example right so again, we have daylight here or Dave light. I need, to, I need to get used to start calling it Dave light. And then you have the close, obviously well above the first day of trading. And it's also a close at new high. Now, one question comes up often is because this is a market on close system. In other words, we're buying on the close of the market when it's closing above the closing high of the opening week, okay? And in this particular case, it has to also be above the range, the high of day one, because that's our rule. If we have the high set on day one, or if the high is set on day one, we have to buy above that, hole, above that high. Now, in this particular case, it's pretty obvious it's a close well above that high. But sometimes it might just be like right at that closing high. And you don't know whether it's going to close above it or not. So you kind of have to make that fish or cut bait decision. And in those cases, just 
maybe require a little bit of wiggle room to where it's going to be decisively above that high. Maybe if near the close it's bidding above that high, then it might be worth taking because you know there's a pretty good chance it'll close above that high. Now here's another example. If you're using the five-day pattern, again, your high was set in this particular case on day one, okay? And your closing high, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I think your closing high would be like right in here, actually. But because it set its high on day one, we want to make sure that close is taken out decisively. Now, your buy would have been on this day here, okay? And you can see that it had a pretty bad retrace afterwards. Now, two things. One, this was just kind of marginally above this high, but it's still a, an official buy, okay? So if you do get long an IPO, one thing you can consider and adjust your share size accordingly is you could put a stop at brand new lows if you're getting in fairly early like this and close your eyes and try to hold on. Just let that stop take you out if you're wrong because you'd obviously be wrong. And you could see maybe a secondary signal or even a pullback type of signal could have been taken in this particular case, even if you did get stopped out. Now, here's an example where you had a really, really, really tight range back here. So, as we'll see in a few seconds, when you do have a real tight range, what you might want to do is consider a secondary signal. By secondary signal, let's say an IPO comes public here, and you're willing to forego that first signal and you wait for something later on down the line. And you could take, in this particular case, this would have been a very obvious 5 SMA breakout, whatever I call this system, Dave Light signal. Or you could have waited for this little pullback here, thrust followed by a pullback. Now, one thing great about this is a lot of times you're going to avoid bad trades. Now, there's a few caveats, as I kind of alluded to a minute ago, such as you want to have decent range. In this particular case, you only had about a point and a half range for a 20 something dollar IPO, which doesn't sound like a whole lot of excitement is happening here. But even if you did follow the rules to the T and you weren't worried about that range, you could see that by the time you got that upside Dave light, it never did close at a new high. So a case like this, no capital is put into harm's way. Now, another case here, you want to wait for that first week of trading to happen, no matter how exciting the IPO is. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and the closing high happened to be on day five. So we're not going to look to get long unless what? We have Dave Light above that five-day simple moving average and a close above 34. So you can see something simple like this can keep you out of trouble. And it's hard when you're watching an IPO that you might be interested in go straight up over those first few days. You feel like you just want to jump in. Keep the questions coming. I promise I'm going to get to you. Now, one pattern that I've observed is the first deep retracement. And it could be either a pioneer signal, meaning early in the release of the IPO, or sometimes it could even be later in the release of the IPO, much later, a secondary type of signal. I haven't treated the secondary signals that much. It's not really what I do, but I think there is something worthwhile in these secondary deep retracements. Now, by secondary, it's still the first deep retracement, but a, prior, a pioneer signal, let me rewind that. Now, it's still a first retracement, even though it's a secondary signal. What I'm saying is, a pioneer signal is back here early in the trading, let's say within the first 20 days or so, and then a secondary signal would be sometime after that.
So if you take a look at TLRY, you can see it took off and then it immediately retraced. So that's what I'd call a first deep retracement. Now, let's say, let's get rid of all this in here. Let's say it took off like it did and then retraced over here like that. That would be still be a first deep retracement, okay? Even though it, it took a while to establish itself. But in this particular case, you can see it came down to the first deep retracement. So if you were trading that, you trade that similar to a pullback. And again, you would want to stop yourself out below the low if you were trading that. And in this particular case, you can see, okay, our high was set on day two. I'm sorry, the closing high was set on day two. So you would look to get long when you have what? Dave Light and a new closing high. Okay, now notice we didn't take out that first week's range because we weren't worried about day one because day one's way down here. Now, here's another example where you had a couple things happening. There's some pioneer things going on, so you could have gotten in. See, day two, the high was made, but that doesn't matter because it wasn't made on day one. So now we're just looking for a new closing high, one, two, three, four, five. So the closing high was set on day one. So your first day of Dave Light, meaning that the low was greater than the five simple moving average, was on this day here. So that would have been a buy on close. Now you did have a pretty serious retracement. So if you took partial profits, you may have scratched out on this trade, but it was also the first deep retracement here, or first pullback, whatever you want to call that. And then it took off from there. Now, by the way, I didn't have time to put it up, but a lot of these stocks that have taken off, I did have on my Landry list. Not all of them. A couple of them were setups that I actually recommended directly, but not all of them were recommended directly simply because they don't really fit or didn't really completely fit the core methodology, which is based on pullbacks. And that's why they weren't in the core trading service. But since I don't have a specific IPO trading service, I often will show those IPOs in there. So I don't want to make it look like it's complete hindsight. I want to make sure that we're pointing these things out. Now, in some cases, I'm getting a lot of questions about this Sonos. I often say, what's the story, fad, or glory? As I've said quite a bit, you should never care what a stock does other than what sector it's in, with a few caveats. And the story I often tell there is Lululemon set up beautifully as a secondary type of setup, a nice little pullback. And I made fun of the company, I even laughed in my trading service when I said, ha, ah, this is a beautiful setup, but ha, ah, they make yoga clothes, that's stupid. Well, it took off about 40% over the next three or four days, and I just sat there with my mouth open, feeling like an idiot for not following my rules on technical analysis. Now, without talking about, without talking out of both sides of my mouth, the point I'm trying to make is when you do have something like a Sonos, if you look up Sonos, what do they do? They make speakers. Well, speakers aren't that exciting. And then somebody emailed me and said, Dave, those Sonos speakers are amazing. Well, that might be the case, but it's kind of hard for me to get excited about a speaker company. So it doesn't mean that I won't trade it. Just like Lululemon, or Lululemon now, I should say. But you can see it took off and it did that first deep retracement down, which is one of our IPO patterns. And I don't have it in here, but it also probably on this day here triggered a five SMA breakout. Now, I didn't take the Sonos trade because I have to ask myself, what's the story, fad, or glory? In other words, glory would mean they're going to solve the world's hunger problems 
or something along those lines. Fad would be comfortable yoga clothes, burritos, or comfortable yoga clothes for guys like me who eat too many burritos, as I often joke. I'm working on that. I've been working on that for 30 years, though. So. <laughs> anyway, so in a case like this, I'm just going to wait for a secondary signal, like let it establish itself. I did look to maybe play a pullback or something along those lines. So you want to wait for secondary signals when there's possibly no story in the underlying stock. You might also want to watch the range. Now, an IPO should have a tremendous amount of excitement to it. If they come priced, higher priced, and there's not a tremendous amount of range, and this looks like a big range, but notice that it's $30 and $35. So what's that? About What's uh, 5 divided by 30? 6? 6%? No, it's more than that, huh? 16%. So it's a sizable range, but it's not huge. And I don't have an exact number on that. Maybe 20-something percent or maybe 20% or more. So you just need to say, well, if the range is fairly tight and it's a higher-priced IPO, let it establish itself a little bit longer than just five days and then look for a setup. So here's the Sonos once again. I thought I had the moving average in. And your buy would have been on that day right there based on that particular pattern. And the reason I didn't go after it was, again, they just make speakers. Now, if three months from now they look like this or it's a TKO or something like that, then maybe I might consider a setup. Now, getting back to the range too tight, this is a more obvious example. You could see that this was up around 21. It went to 22 and a half, almost 23, but that's a pretty tight range. Not much to get excited about. So let's wait for a secondary signal. Instead of trying to get in right here, somewhere after day five, let's just let it prove itself, okay? And sometimes it's hard to let it go. Like that Sonos, I can tell you right now, when that Sonos begins to take off, I'm still human. I'm going to cuss and fuss, and I'm going to be aggravated that I missed that initial push higher. But you have to, the secret to this business is making decisions and living with them. So I made a decision not to do it. When it does, or if it does take off, I just need to tell myself, self, you said that you were not going to take the trade. You didn't take the trade. You followed your plan. So don't get angry. Now, I probably spend too much time telling you what could go wrong. But I think it's important to do that. And right now I'm on a couple of mailing lists, and I don't know how I get on these things, but it looks like the, the advertisers on my YouTube channel are these pump and dump type of people. I made ten thousand dollars. It's not even I haven't even had breakfast yet. Margin call. How many times I have to tell you? Every Thursday I do a show. <laughs> so like everything, so like everything, it doesn't always work. If it did, or anything else for that matter always worked, then you never see my fat ass again. So here's a case where if you were trading that particular pattern, now you could maybe argue that the range was a little tight on this, but let's just say you traded the pattern because the range began to expand here, then you could see it really didn't materialize before it came back in. If memory serves, I think I lost money on this trade. So again, as I said a minute ago, what's the story, fat or glory? Well, this is an oil field stock. And maybe it's the greatest oil field stock ever, but instead of trying to get in early on back here, even though it did work, I'm going to wait for a secondary signal. So you had a nice secondary signal here, but if you give it a lot of wiggle room, you probably wouldn't have triggered in. And even if you did, you'd still be long and not stopped out. So it's kind of hard to get very excited about an oil field stock. So in a case like that, you want to make sure you are waiting for that 
secondary signal. Now, here's an airline, okay? Range is fairly tight, and it's two points. I guess it's okay for a $11 stock. But for me, instead of trying to get in early for an airline, I'm going to wait for it to prove itself. Doesn't mean that I won't buy it when it sets up down the road, or if it sets up down the road. But for now, I'm going to hold off on that one. And it's a tough decision sometimes, deciding whether to go or no go on a new issue. Now, if it's a little biotech and it's got good range and you've got that buy it B pattern, or you've got that five-day SMA breakout, then by all means, go for it. Now, here's a case where you do have a stock, but it's much, much higher priced. And technically, your buy would be on this day here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, okay? Okay. But I'd like to see a close that's very much above this range in here. One thing that, and there's not enough time to get into a lot of details today, but one thing I have found with IPOs is if they're priced too high, they're going to die. And a lot of times these higher price IPOs begin to implode. So I'm a little bit more skeptical with an IPO that's priced a little higher. And like the buy at B, one of the rules that buy at B is that it has to come public less than $20 a share. So in a case like this, technically this would have been your buy. It's higher price. It's hard for me to get excited about buying into this unless, of course, we see some range expansion. Now, again, I don't want to make it look like you'd avoid all losing trades. But in a case like this, for instance, it's asset management. Well, it's hard for me to get excited about asset management. So maybe instead of trying to get in early, let's wait for a secondary signal. So technically, this would have been a buy yesterday. Did I buy it? No. Why? Well, it's an asset management company. It's hard for me to get excited about an asset management company. Now, let's wait for a secondary signal. Nice little pullback. Maybe I'll do it. Here's an electronic store, okay? Well, the good news here, the good news is we can no longer get a pioneer signal, okay, because it's been public for a couple of months. So it's hard, number one, to get excited about a pioneer store, I'm sorry, electronic store, but the good news is it made its high on day two for that first week. So it would have to be well above 27 for us to get excited. So now maybe we can start watching this one. But as a pioneer trade, again, it's just going to be hard for me to get excited about a major airline, electronic store, or possibly an oil field stock. Now, when I initially talked about this setup, I guess it was two years ago or a year and a half ago we discovered this, whenever Snapchat came public, one thing I've wanted to point out is don't rush out and trade it without your own due diligence. I tend to discover something and then I immediately rush it to you guys without fleshing it out or then flesh it out in the next couple of years. I think I have something here. I think I have something here's worthwhile. I've been getting a lot of feedback from you guys, making me feel really good about it. I've been trading it. I'm happy with it. But like anything, do your own due diligence. Play devil's advocate. Show me or show yourself, I should say times when it doesn't work. Convince yourself that it works, but make sure you fully understand that sometimes it doesn't. There I go again, demarketing myself. Now, as I pointed out earlier, there's a couple things you do want to pay attention to. You want to pay attention to the range. If the range is really tight, there's not a whole lot of excitement in it. Instead of looking to trade that little pioneer signal right here, why not let it break out decisively and then look for it to pull back? Now, in some of the examples, you'll see we had a tight range, but then the breakout and the trigger was fairly significant. So then you kind of have to make that go and no go decision. But a case like this, maybe it's worth a shot. So again, range. And keep in mind, we flesh these things out in a lot more detail over eight hours in the course. But I'm just trying to give you a little thumbnail here. Money management is also crucial. If you're trading these pioneer setups, if you could stomach putting that stock right below that range. In other words, if it's making a new low, 
then you have to get out the way, then that can often be a great thing. And again, what's a story, fad, or glory? If you don't think there's some kind of fad or glory that could be awesome here, then wait for that. Instead of trying to trade that first little breakout, let it establish stuff and then trade a pullback. Because if there is some incredible story, fad, or glory, if Sonos turns out to be the best speakers in speaker town, then the stock will do this longer term. So be willing to forego that first first push higher. Now, the reason we do look to trade the first push higher is because that's where a lot of the euphoria is in the IPOs. A lot of the excitement comes in very early on, and then it eventually dies out. But that's okay. That's where our bread and butter is. And keep in mind that even... Fairly well-established issues, which I call toddlers, IPOs that have been public for, let's say, six months, a year, and sometimes even longer, can still offer good trading opportunities. Now, volume can be a little tricky, and you have to pay attention to that. That's something that I spend a lot of time talking about in the IPO course, and that's like you just have to kind of gauge it day by day. You don't have a big, long, average volume. A couple days ago, we got an IPO we we're watching in the service as an ancillary setup, and I got a tweet from someone saying, hey, geez, look at the look at the spread on this thing. It's like, okay, well, it's got decent volume. They said, look at the spread, look at the volume. I was like, eh, the volume's okay. But, yes, you're right, that spread is a little wide, so you might want to keep an eye on that spread. And the more inefficient markets you trade, the more inefficient a market is that you trade, I should say, the more you have to pay attention to things like volumes and spreads because they're going to likely be worse. But that's a good thing if you read the market wizards, and I've found this in my own trading, sometimes your worst fills are your best trades. Now, one main point that I am making here, and it's something that I really went set out to do, and I think I've succeeded, if I say so myself, to avoid something like snap crap, is that you're much better off waiting a week or so for an IPO to establish itself versus getting caught up in the initial euphoria. Now, in some cases, buy at B could get you long a day or two early. Okay, lots of questions coming in. Let's see if we can do it. Usually I try to keep up with questions, but there's a, I had a lot I wanted to get covered first. Okay. How about stocks that have the low on day first day of trading? Does that mean anything longer term? That's a good point. Um, I don't know, but I think that I think you're onto something. And that's my whole point is that the significant high or low is made in the first week of trading. And yes, yeah, sometimes you look at some of these stocks, they make their low on day one and they never look back. And that's one reason why I say if you could stomach it, if you're trading these pioneer setups, put your stop in at brand new lows, at all-time lows. And that way, you know, if it doesn't work out, then the setup has failed for sure. So whenever you put a stop in, you always ask yourself, where would I be wrong? Where would the setup have failed? As a trend follower, if a market is making new lows, I don't know why I sound like Jackie Mason, <laughs> then you are wrong. But good point on that. And you're probably on to something. First day lows, yes. Assuming you're going to cover money management and position sizing. No, I've covered that uh, kind of ad nauseum before, and I'm working on a learning management system, which I'll show you here in just one second. And I've got a whole course just on money management. There's going to be a nominal charge to get in, and all the courses are free. There's still some premium courses, but you'll get those for free in time, too. And I'll show you that in just one second. But the money management is you want to risk a small percentage if stopped out on each individual stock. And then you want to take partial profits and trail the stop higher. Now, in these crazy IPOs, the rule of thumb is 
maybe you might want to go a little bit smaller than 2% on those, okay? But if you email me offline, I'll uh, I'll give you some I'll give you access to the money management module and I'll give you a hand with that. I'm sorry, can you reinforce how you determine day one or is this still about IPOs? Yeah, we're still talking about IPOs. Day one would be, let's say, uh, Big Dave's trading education and joke service comes out on day one, has a high of 10, a low of six or whatever. That would be day one, the first day it comes public. Okay. It counts as day one. That's your first, the first bar you have on your chart is day one. Okay. Now your close is going to be, let's say you've got one week's worth of trading, closes here, closes here, closes here, closes here, and then closes here. With these patterns, we're looking for the high close, the greater of the highest close of five days, okay, or the high of day one. So even though, it, let's say this market closed down here, even though this close would be a new closing high, it's not above day one, okay? So the greater of these two. TLROI made a low on day one. All right, good observation. Yeah, I think you're definitely, and here's why I love to teach, because you guys make me think from both a devil's advocate standpoint and a positive standpoint. You also occasionally remind me that a stock is set up that I need to take a look at. Just the opposite of what I'm here to do is teach you and show you what to trade. Sometimes you do just the opposite. And that for that, I thank you. But yeah, there's definitely some fodder for research there. Low on day one, love it, absolutely. TLRY, low on day one. Would you recommend using Dave Light setup as an entry for pullbacks, IPOs, or otherwise? Um, I have a lot of clients that, or or fans, I should say, either way, that are using Dave Light for various things. Um, I. I have a pullback setup called Dave Light Pullbacks. It's kind of similar to Lindy Rasky's Holy Grail. If you have Meta stock, uh, the indicator is in there. And all I'm looking for is Dave Light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average, for a consecutive period of time, and then a, and then a pullback to the moving average. And I also have a transitional pattern, same sort of thing, where you're looking for. Just a few days of Dave Light, I think it's five, and then a pullback to the moving average. So, yeah, you can certainly use that. Okay. You're welcome, Johnny. Would it be better to place a buy order above the day it closed at the new high? Rather than buying on a close, that way there is follow through. Well, I looked at it. I looked at it several ways. Uh, in the IPO course, I did several things. Um, one, let's say it was the the buy at B. If we're looking to buy one, two, three, four, five, and let's say we're this day here. Okay, this would be the high close. So on day five, we're looking to buy. I looked at it like that. Let's say you miss that trade. Look to buy in the next open no matter where that is. And sometimes that's worked out okay. There's always a trade-off in trading. Um, sometimes it might open way up here, okay? The more confirmation you wait for, the more losing trades you'll miss, but the more winning trades you'll miss also. So I hear what you're saying if you're waiting for a trigger, but if you if you don't... Let's say you're waiting for that market to rally above that closing high, and it does intraday, but then it comes right back in. That's one reason that you're waiting for that buy on close confirmation, because at the close, everybody agrees on the price for the day. Okay. So let me see if I answer your question. We better to place a buy order above the day it closed at the new high rather than buying on the close. That way there's follow through. Well, you're always going to have – the later you get in, the, the the better the chance of you missing a trend, okay? But the better the chances you also missing a false move. 
So again, the more confirmation you require, the later you're going to get in. And sometimes you could miss a substantial move by requiring additional follow through. Recently, I was talking about uh, the, just buying when you had two lows above the 50 week moving average, provided you're within 10% of all time highs for the index. If going for the indices, go in and watch that from last week's week of charts. Uh, for reference, in case somebody's watching the recordings, today's the 30th, so it'd be the 823 week of charts. Okay. And one thing that I fleshed out in that was like, if you required more confirmation to try to avoid a whipsaw, then, yeah, if this turned into a 400% move longer term, then so what if you give up this much of it? Unfortunately, if this move only went to here and came back in, by trying, by trying to avoid whipsaw, you would actually have introduced more possible whipsaw into it. So... There's always a trade-off in how you do things. I hope I answered that question. I know I've kind of talked talked around in circles. Who was that, Dan? It's old coffin. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and uh, looks like we'll get at the live charts. Um, just real quick, I'll show you this real quick. This is the learning management system I've been working on, and I'm pretty excited about it. And I know I'm a nerd, but I've been busting my butt on this. This is why I've been a little aloof lately. And if you go to the trading courses down here, remember I was just talking about money management. I've got a whole course here just on the money management. And I think you guys are going to really like this stuff. And it's learning management in that we're going to be able to track the progress. Now, these courses are premium courses up here. But the good news is if you stick with these, by the time you finish all these, these will be free because there's going to be bonuses as you go. But you can see right here, we can track the progress. Now, let's say I get a lot of questions on money management from Joe. And I come in here and I can say, well, Joe, you, you're not getting either. I'm a bad teacher or you're not getting it because I covered that in the course. And then we come here and say, well, Joe hasn't finished money management. So, We'll answer his question probably at a Q&A session, and then I'll remind Joe that maybe he should finish money management. Anyway, I know I'm a nerd. So another thing that I'm introducing here is going to be 911 calls. You get in a bind on a trade, you give me a call, and those will come. The longer you stay a member, the more calls you'll get. And then private calls. The yeah. private private consultation in half hour chunks will be free with time. Each month a new bonus is unlocked. And early on, the first thing I do within the first month, you'll get all three of the books just to get you up to speed as quickly as possible. Now I know I'm a nerd, but I'm pretty excited about this. I've been showing it to a few few of you guys and I really thanks to the and you guys have been giving me some wonderful feedback and I think it's really going to get everybody up to speed with the methodology with trading in general one of the things I'm really proud of is the trading psychology and I could see where that's going to get huge for a while in fact I have was doing so much work on psychology if you're coming to the recent week of charts it's like I kind of had to tap the brakes on that and get back to the methodology like we're doing today talk about the market timing like we did over the past few weeks, et cetera. But I know, I know me, the secret to trading is really getting your mindset right. Everything else is fairly mechanical. Now, there's a little discretion, but even the discretion is fairly mechanical. The hard part is your attitude. All right, let's uh, take a look at some open charts, keep the questions coming, and... Uh, if you guys want to start asking about individual issues, please do so now. Okay, uh, the link, somebody's asked me, traded, the link for Trading Full Circle. And yeah, these first videos will be, uh, these are all part, the intro videos of, are also in the learning management system. DaveLander.com, 2-trade-doc-successfully. Just put your name in. And you'll get those first four videos. And there's a lot of good stuff in those. If I say so myself, I've actually had 
people email me and say, you're not just trying to sell us a course, which of course I am, but I wanted to give some people the background knowledge to let them know that buy and hold didn't work. Psychology is vitally important, which most people overlook. You're not going to get rich overnight, like these scumbags suggest. <laughs> And you can get that off. I think it's still on my homepage, too. Okay. Linda Rasky says, buy the first pullback after a new high. In IPOs? Um yeah, I mean, you know, even in regular stocks, I often preach about, let's say you've got uh, a base like this and you get a new high coming out of the base. Don't buy that breakout in an established issue, but certainly look to play that first pullback. That's the first pullback after that base breakout. That's probably what Linda is referring to. You always get something good out of Linda. Linda's writing a book, and she had emailed me a while back, and, and I encouraged her, strongly urged her to do it. So I'm not uh, – Damon, her husband, had mentioned something last week in a webinar that she's working on it. So hopefully uh, she'll keep working on that. All right, let's take a look at the P's. The reoccurring theme lately has been when the market is at or near all-time highs, give the benefit of the doubt, go in and watch last week's presentation. And then I also built a market timing module for the members area just on that. So I hope we get this thing launched. My countdown clock says 28 days. God willing. I had to reset that clock once so far. <laughs> but God willing, I hope to get it launched by then. But what I was saying recently is that as long as the market is at or near all-time highs, and near lately has been, let's just say, 10% on a weekly basis, so you can see if you went back a couple of months, it was within 3% of all-time highs, okay? So give it the benefit of the doubt. And that kind of goes back to the ABC thing. As long as, somewhere, as long as it's somewhere near C, then look to either get long or stay long. So I'm going to continue to give this market the benefit of the doubt. We've got a nice little gap here, which let's take a little spider so we get a true open. Nice little gap here so far, so good. But Dave, aren't gaps filled? Nah. Yeah, maybe 10 years from now. Maybe 10 years from now this gap will get filled. Okay? Maybe tomorrow. Anyway, so far so good. A uh, little weakness obviously on the open today, but eh, that's okay. So far, breaking out. A lot of worry about this prior high in here. And, yeah, I sure would feel a heck of a lot better if the P's would just break out and not look back for a while before pulling back. But again, what am I going to do? I'm going to give the market the benefit of the doubt. All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ also breaking out to new highs. What I like about the NASDAQ is you have a little bit more acceleration here. You also have a little bit of persistency here, meaning that the market goes up day after day after day. One of the things I woke up this morning thinking about was, is there a way to develop like a narrow channel band which would take into consideration a market's persistency? And you get make sure you long or figure out a way to get long the persistent markets, especially when they're in that narrow band. What do I mean by that? Well, look back here in the NASDAQ. Notice that you had a fairly narrow band higher. So that's just kind of a cool thing. Maybe Dave Light would help get you in to markets like that. But it's just something I woke up thinking about. When you get older, you wake up thinking about different things than you used to. <laughs> I remember when I was engaged... One of my dopey friends, dopey and, well, it's a long story. But anyway, we were playing musical chairs with uh, my two-year-old and her friends were having a party for her. 
and my buddy came over and said, Dave, your parties have changed. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Russell 2000, new highs. Just yesterday, off those new highs a little bit. But so far, so good. The Russell was stuck in the sideways range forever, but now beginning to break out. I, I don't like the way it's drifting. You can't always get what you want, like Mick said. But if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. I'd much rather it look like this breaking out as opposed to just drifting higher. But I'm not, I'm not going to run out and get crazy bearish or anything because it's not doing exactly what I want. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to err on the side of longer-term trend. Now, one thing I've been saying lately is I'm kind of seeing these sectors that are underperforming as being glass half full with the market. Now, not that that's a positive for the market, but if every sector was going straight up and the market was making brand new highs, then I would think that maybe the market is priced for perfection. A little counterintuitive for a trend guy to say something like that. I realize that. But the fact that the market's making new highs without a lot of these sectors joining in made me think that, well, maybe these sectors will begin to rally. What am I doing? Given the overall market benefit of the doubt, maybe these sectors will begin to rally and push the market higher. And so far, knock on wood, ow, it hurts my head. It has done that. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy energies or some of these weakest areas. I would focus on those areas that are stronger. But as long as some of these areas, and let me find you a couple, like insurance, you can see it's been improving as of late. Not a great trend, but it's been improving. And manufacturing up towards new multi-month highs. Doesn't look fantastic longer term, but it's been improving as of late. So I think these areas are going to help the market to go higher. Transports have been improving as of late in other ones areas. And then obviously with the market at brand new highs, some areas like retail and health services and drugs and quite a few other areas are banging out new highs, hardware, software, etc. All right. Let's look, take a look at your picks. AMRX. So the state of the market is good, in case you didn't gather that. Now, this would be what I would call a toddler type of setup. So you had your, your pioneer entries would have been back here. Your first deep retracement would have been right here. And now you're going into more of an established issue. Ideally, I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback here. But in IPO, sometimes you can't get too picky. So yes or no, I would say yes. That looks pretty good as a pullback. Send. Send. Okay. Well, this is another one of these toddler type of setups, sort of an IPO. It has broken out. What did we just talk about? First pullback after a base breakout. Okay, so yeah, on a little bit more pullback, I wouldn't want it to pull all the way back to this base, but if it could pull back to maybe 33, absolutely. Good eye on that one, Donald. LTRX. Yeah, this one's a little bit on the crazy side. It's got an HV of 89. Volume's a little bit light, especially given the fact that it's a lower price stock. So in a case like this, I would like to see the mother of all knockout moves because it is kind of wild and crazy and thin. And it also has made a tremendous move higher. What's that? 167% over a short period of time. So that might even be too crazy for Big Dave, but I hear you. L-I-Q-T. T. Okay, um, well, it's kind of a, it's a low price. Not that I would toss it out because it's low priced. I'd watch the volume since it is so low priced. Uh, put, yeah, put this on your momentum list. So good eye as far as that's concerned, okay? But I wouldn't rush out and trade it just yet. But maybe, just maybe on a pullback, it might be worth a shot. NVTA. 
Okay. Now this is pretty interesting here. Let's back this our way out. Now this would be sort of what I call a toddler. A toddler could be within the first one to three years or so. I don't have a specific date in mind. But this is an IPO where it looks like there was some initial euphoria and then it died out. Let's go in and see what happened since we have a little time when this IPO first came public and see what happened. Talk amongst yourselves. Keep the stock picks coming. Oh, come on. It's taking forever. Let me do it like this, maybe. Oh, here we go. Waiting for pizza. Wasting your life. I didn't think it would take me this long. All right, where are we? One, two, three, four, five. It looks to me like the high was set on day one, and it never did close above that high. And I know it was a long run for a short slide, but the point I wanted to make is the stock came public around 20 and then imploded. Let's just see. Let's say if you'd have bought on the first day. I can make it work. You would have lost... Sixty-five percent of your money, or more. All right, let's get back to where we were. Yeah, nice acceleration higher. A uh, little crazy. Yeah, that's a three hundred percent move from the lows, but it did take out a lot of resistance in here. It used to be kind of wide and loose and all over the place, but the personality is beginning to change. So yes, I like this one a lot, but it's going to have to have the mother of all knockouts. Let me show you one thing I do like about it. One, it started this little trend higher with a gap. And then two, the trend accelerated higher. As I preach, you want acceleration higher and not deceleration higher. Even though the net net in this case, this is still higher than this, it's, deceler it's decelerated in this particular case. It's acceler accelerated higher. Easy for me to say. So, yeah, I want to pull back. Absolutely. Is CGC enough of a pullback? Why do I know that stock? CGC. No. No. Okay, first thing I'm seeing here, look at this. The HV is, sound like, anybody remember Tiny Elvis? Look at look at his stock. Look at that. Look at that stock. It's huge. HV is about 100, so we know it's a wild and crazy one, Okay. The move from here, 25 to 50 round numbers, that's a 100% move over a short period of time. So, yeah, if you want to go after this one because it's a crazy momentum stock, then you want to see the mother of all trend knockout moves, maybe something down to the, let's say, 37 or so, because it's got to shake some people out. So, no, not enough pullback, at least for my taste just yet. Okay. Any more? Okay. Well, while we're in an impasse, let me just thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time and a busy schedule. To those of you who watched the recording and didn't get to make it because you didn't get a reminder, I'm going to work on that. And hopefully this fall, once we get this learning management launched, all that housekeeping will be a little bit better. Anyway, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time and a busy schedule. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a great weekend. Oh, by the way, next week, I'm not going to do a show. I find it's hard to do a show when it's a holiday week. So I'm going to be on laptop for a couple of days, and then uh, we'll start back the following week. So no show next week. Everybody uh, enjoy your Labor Day holiday. Oh, you're not a pain. No, Johnny says, sorry for being a PITA. No, you're not a pain, Johnny. No, that's how you learn, man. Do you play trend like 5G stocks? I don't know what you mean by 5G. Do you play trend like 5G stocks? Five grand stocks? Well, shoot me a private email. We'll uh, we'll flesh that out further. 
All right. Once again, thanks everybody for coming and we'll talk again next week. Thank you so much. Or week after next.